Yes. Here we go. Thank you for listening. All right. We are on. We are live. We have people on Facebook Live. So hello to everybody on Facebook Live. We have Ian over here on Zoom. We got lots of people here in person. And it's so nice. Uh, last minute you got told that there's a show and you still came. Really, really chuffed by that. And we have uh, all the people on Tara Anytime as well. Thank you very much for joining me. Tara content and good Tara content, TaraAnytime.com. Right. Okay. So I was in the middle of telling the story about the Amish people. You said about the Amish people. There's a famous story, actually. Rabbi Tversky tells that he once got on a, um, he got on a bus in New York, dressed like a Hasid. And this fellow, secular fellow, walked over to him and started berating him in Yiddish. He is screaming at him, how could you dress like this? And how dare you? In a modern city, you shouldn't dress like that. He's giving Rabbi Tversky a real piece of his mind. And Rabbi Tversky says to him, excuse me, excuse me, I, I don't know what you're saying. What are you saying? He says, what? He says, I don't understand that. I'm Amish. I, I don't know what you want from me. And the fellow's like, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I just was, I, I wanted to tell you how much I admire the fact that you're willing to stick to your guns and that no matter what happens, you do exactly what your traditions have been for hundreds of years. I'm so, so sorry for insulting you. I didn't mean to insult you. Do, please do take my apologies. And the rabbi trust comes and says like, Russia, Marusha, I'm a yid, like, you know. If I was Amish, you're telling me I'm the greatest guy around because you know what? I kept my traditions. But as a Jew, if I kept my traditions, you're yelling at me for being behind on the times. I mean, Hashem. what's wrong with you? What's the matter with you? Okay, so there we go. That's it for brotherly love, which we're going to discuss tonight, brotherly love. We have lots of interesting things to discuss tonight. There's a very interesting Pasha, the Pasha of Ayigash. In Pasha's Ayigash, when we discuss the reconciliation of Yosef and his brothers, and I want to discuss a few different items over here. So let's start with the following. Rav Zalman Sorotskin, who we mention almost every year because he always keeps on coming up with some really, really beautiful stuff, says the following. We have in this week's Pasha, right at the beginning, we read about Yehuda, by Yigash El of Yehuda. Yehuda is at page 250 in the Art Scroll for Moshim, chapter 41, verse 18. Yehuda steps forward. He approaches him, i.e. approaches Yosef. Let's just remind us of what happened last week. Last week, Yosef finally gets to see Binyamin. They have a party together. They get drunk. And then Yosef says to the person in charge of his house, I want you to fill up everybody's ba bag with as much food as they can carry. Take my silver goblet and stick it in the bag of the young one. You know, the new one that just showed up this time for the first time? Yeah, him, exactly. He goes, w w w don't ask questions. I've told you to do it. Fine. Sticks it in there. They go, bye. Thank you so much for your hospitality. No, it's great. Thank you for coming. Enjoy. Come again. You know, you know those you know those goodbyes that you say, thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. You know, you, you, you can't get out of it. You can't leave. Okay, well, you go already. Just, I, I've had thank you enough from you already. Just leave. They finally leave and they're going, they just left the town. And he says, okay, run after them and tell them, why are you paying me back the wrong thing? I've done you a favor. I've been so nice to you. I've given you to eat. I've given you now all of this stuff. And you go and you steal the silver goblet from my master. She's like, me? So they, they come and they say to Binyam, what, what were you talking about? But, you know, they're even one saying the other way around. He says, listen, didn't we just come back with money saying that you guys made a mistake and put extra money into our pockets? We brought back extra money from Israel to pay you twice. So now I'm going to, in your own house, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to steal the silver goblet. I wouldn't do that. Anyway, they look through, find it in Benjamin's bag. They come back and Yehuda says, listen, what should we say? We all been found guilty and we're all going to be your slaves. To which Yosef says, no, 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 no. I don't, that's not fair. None of you stole. The only person that stole is that little kid, right? That one, Benjamin. Yeah. Okay. He stays. Everybody else can go back home. And now Yehuda's worst nightmare has come true. Because Yehuda basically said, Dad, I swear, I promise on my life in this world and the next, this kid 
is coming home, no matter what happens. Basically, the Pasha, if you look in the Tagum, the Pasha Tagum Yonason, there's a translation in the Aramaic by Rav Yonas Menuzil, one of the greatest Tanaim, one of the greatest authors in the Mishnah, he actually writes over there a whole Midrash, how Yehuda basically said, listen, you either do me a favor and give me back my brother, and if you don't, I'm literally, we're going to wipe out this whole place. Because you might have heard, have you heard a place called Shechem we spoke about it a few weeks ago? Yeah, well, there were 24,000 people that got wiped out by two of us. There were Shimon and Levi. They were kids at the time. <laughs> just wait now that we're a little bit older and but stronger. We're adults now. Just wait till we can do what to see what we can do to you. And he's really giving Yosef a very, very hard time now. Because as we read, he gives him a whole rundown. He says, so Yuda comes forward. He says, I want to speak to you. You've asked us. This is a this is like a setup. This is a frame. You know, sometimes something happens and you're like, okay, is everybody in on this? Is everybody in on this stupidity? Because like this is this is not funny, okay? You ever had that where you're just about to say to people, okay, everybody, this is not funny. We can all say, ha, 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 you're having a laugh at my expense, but this isn't funny. What are you doing? You asked us to bring him down. We asked you, what well, you started asking us all sorts of questions. This is how Rashi explains it. You said, do you have a father? Do you have any brothers? Where are you from? You are Miraglim. You are spies. What's the matter with you? Like you took a liking or dislike to us. And as soon as we came, you made our lives crazy. You're making us Meshuggah. What are you making us Meshuggah for? Just we came, we wanted food, let's pay for the food, let's go home, right? You ever had that? There's a certain annoying shops that you go into where the shopkeeper's that little bit too friendly, like, you know, I could have uh, just uh, two pieces of shenanigans. He goes, so who are you having for Shabbos this week? And you're like, I didn't ask you, because last week you had five pieces of shenanigans, this week you're having 10. So I know you're having guests for Shabbos. Come on, who are the guests for Shabbos? I, I didn't, come, you know, at one point or another, you start using a different butcher. I don't want you sort of grilling me every week. What's going on? Remember, my wife told me when she was in Gateshead in the seminary, she said that they had over there in the bank, there are two banks over there on Coatsworth Road. That was like the high street in Gateshead and Benjamin. And they had like two banks. It was, I mean, you, you go see, it's not much of a high street. It's not much to see in Gateshead in general. Not much of a high street over there. But they had two banks and you went into the bank. And a lot of these times they said, first of all, whenever Newcastle was playing, everybody was in black and white. You know, this is the tune army. He said it was just ridiculous. If the whole bank turned into some kind of like football match, they're screaming at each other and they're excited, etc. But you came in to take out money and you're like, okay, I'd like to take out 10 pounds, please. And be like, your brother took out 20. I think you might want to take out 20 also. He said this, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on this week. I think you'll need a bit more money. Like, I didn't ask you, right? That's why I go to cash machine. The cash machine doesn't say to me, you took out 20 pounds last week. Yeah, They don't make you crazy about it. I say 20 pounds, it comes out. Stop asking stupid questions. He also says, you're driving us crazy. Where you from? Who's your father? Who's your brothers? Bring him down. I want to meet the guy. What's your problem? All we want to do is buy food. Give us the food and let's go home. And you come up with all these questions and you drive us crazy. Then you ask to bring him down. You want to see him. We show him to you. We want to go back home. And then we find this, this gum. Come on. You're expecting me to believe that this is just happenstance? That's how it happened? That's basically what he's saying to him. But then he finishes off. Yuda finishes off. When I come, this is Apostle Glamid, verse 30. When I come back to my father, to your servant, and the young man is not with us. His soul is bounded with him forever. And what's going to happen is when my father will see that Binyamin's not there, he will just die. And then you know what's going to happen? We'll have brought down the holiness. Never heard of that. That's an interesting word. Huh? All right, you know, as save us. The elder, okay, save us means becoming old. So hoariness. There you go. So they're gonna make him die, you know. And here he says, Yehuda, the following: Ki your servant. Why am I the one that's making such a fuss? Why are not the other brothers making another fuss? Ki because I was a. I took responsibility for this young man. Meim for my father. Im If I don't bring him to you, the I will be remain. A sinner to my father all of your days. And therefore, I want to remain here 
and he will go up. What am I going to do? I'm going to send, I'm going to go up to my father. He's going to see that the young man is not over here anymore. And that's going to be terrible. I cannot bear to see any more damage to my father. And so therefore, you know what? Take me. I'm much better than him. I'm stronger. I'm a better diplomat. You know, this is the one of the youngest one. He's a young kid over here. Take me. I'm much better at this. That's what Yoda says. And I've taken responsibility for him. So I take responsibility. I'm going to do this. Yosef can't handle it anymore. Yosef says, everybody out. Everybody goes on. Yosef says, I'm Yosef. Okay? That is the story that we have over here. So what Reb Sorotskin points out is that this situation over here of Yehuda stepping up to take responsibility for his brothers is what created an eternal bond between the tribe of Binyamin and the tribe of Judah. We shall speak about in a minute. I mean, we know that there's always been the fact that Yehuda takes responsibility over here is one of the traits that makes him be the Melech. He becomes the king. The king is the one that takes responsibility. Yehuda is willing to take responsibility, which is why Yehuda becomes Malchus. But there's something else that happens. I mean, not only does Yehuda now become the progenitor of the Malucha of the Jewish monarchy, he also now creates a bond with Binyamin that never gets severed. And when you see, when you look at the base of Migdash, where was the base of Migdash built? The base of Migdash was built in whose part? Yehuda's part. However, where was the Mizbeach? In Benjamin's part. There was a short, a little bit of a, an indentation, and Benjamin's part came up to exactly where the Mizbeach was. That was Benjamin. So you have that Benjamin with Judah together. When the tribes, we spoke about this last week, actually, it was last week or two weeks ago, we spoke about the 10 tribes and the two tribes when the kingdom is of Israel split, right? The elder people told Rehavim, the son of Shlomo, don't raise the taxes. The young people said to Shlomo's son, raise the taxes, show them who's in charge. And it split the kingdom. You split the kingdom into 10 tribes and two tribes. Who's the two tribes that remain together? Judah, and so it's called the land. That's why it's called Ephraim, which is the northern one, and Yehuda. Those are the two. But who's with Judah? Benjamin. And we see that the whole way through that there remains this connection now between Judah and Benjamin all the way through. Why? Because Judah took responsibility for him. And here, this is what Rav Sorotskin says, that he takes responsibility for him, which creates from then on an eternal bond. And I think that there's a very important lesson over here also. And that is, in general, in Judaism, how do we see love? And how do you grow love? Okay, so we have a very, very different belief in Judaism than Hollywood. Surprise, I mean, everybody should, right? You know, if you, if you think Hollywood shows you reality, then, then you need to have a reality check, right? I remember we had over here, this is one of the things I learned. We had over here this, oh, how many years ago is it now? It's about four or five years ago, it was pre-corona. They had this group of five Jews or 10 Jews, group of 10 Jews that were going to... First, they came here, and then they were here for Purim, and then they were going to Israel. So they were, they were following them around for one week in Manchester, and they followed them around for one week again in Israel. And they put together a program. I can't remember what it was called. But our shul and my laning of the Megillah was in was on the BBC. Do you, does anybody remember that show? Do you remember what I'm talking about? Huh? Do you remember when they came? Yeah? And there was like a, then a section, which was the TV section. Anybody didn't want to be the TV section, be a different section. Do you remember the cameras here? Yeah, yeah, they had the cameras. And I remember because I was with them for a few different sessions. One was where we had Louise Elman and we interviewed Louise Elman, the MP, and we had a few different sessions. And at one point or another, I came to them and says, look, would you guys like to come tomorrow to hear the lady? They're like, well, will there be enough time? I don't know. Your flight's at 12.30. You can come. I was going through the time. So, ah, stop, stop. I'm like, what? Camera wasn't here. Camera, come here. Microphone. Yeah, invite them again. Yeah. And that's what happened a few times. Anytime there was a really good sentence that they missed on camera, what did they do? They staged it again. And so, yes, yeah, that's what happened. I'm telling you, because I was part of this. And I think to myself, some reality TV. This isn't reality TV. They're like, whenever they say something that, whenever you say something that they like, they bring the camera and they catch it on camera. Okay, you know, even reality television is staged. Certainly everything else. So how do you, understand love so love in popular culture 
you fall into love, you fall out of love, you walk down the street and you see somebody, you can fall in love with that person. You've been married to your wife for 35 years. It's all out the window. It doesn't make a difference. Now there's a new woman in my life. And you've seen this many, many times and they, they sell you the lie. This is a lie like none other. You don't fall in and out of love. Remember hearing somebody discussing with Matt Hancock. Matt Hancock fell in love with this woman. He left his wife. He left his children with this other woman. And you think to yourself, you're, you're such an idiot. Why'd you do that? Why'd you give up something real for this? Uh, who's Matt Hancock? He used to be the health secretary for many years. He was the health secretary during the COVID times. Pardon? Yeah, he was also on reality TV that he was trying to do his last thing, but he was he got kicked out from being the health secretary because he was caught smooching with someone. Yeah, yeah, and broke breaking his own COVID rules. So he was uh, he was breaking his own COVID rules, and then once they caught him and they whistle blew at him, then he had to go. Whatever you know. That's, huh? Okay, Boris said it's all right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's how it goes. You know this story. You know the famous story that uh, you know there was a there was a fellow that wanted three officers showing up to his. Uh, you know they needed to serve at a party. He says I want three officers and I don't want any Jews coming here. You sure? Yes, I don't want any Jews. Anyway, so this guy's waiting for these three officers to show up for this party to help him out to serve, and these three Negro officers show up. And he's like, black officers, where do they come from? And there's like, there must be a mistake. How can they say, no, no, no. Sergeant Goldberg never makes mistakes when he sends us, right? Okay, that's how, this is what it is. Like, you know, Boris Johnson doesn't make mistakes when he says that this is legal. Yeah, yeah, we listen to Boris Johnson about what is and what isn't legal on COVID. Good luck, yeah? But what we understand is, is that love is the result of tremendous amounts of giving. You don't just fall in love with someone. You know what that's called in Judaism? It's called infatuation. That's what it is. It's not love. You can be infatuated with somebody. You can feel great feelings for them, but it's not real. It only becomes real after a very long time of working together, et cetera, et cetera. Only that way can you develop real love. You never develop real love. You know, you speak, I'll ask you an honest question. Who's more in love? A young couple getting married after three months of knowing each other or a couple has been married for 20 or 30 years. Don't know that once. <laughs> you know, sometimes a couple after 20 or 30 years, they were, they're willing to wring each other's necks. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? My wife has a, you know, you know what my wife says, uh, you know, to, she has an uncle and they, he sometimes doesn't get on with his wife and he always says to his wife, don't worry, sweetheart. With my mazel, we'll be married forever. <laughs> okay, with, uh, with, with your mazel, I'm going to live on forever. Like something like that. Like, oh, goodness gracious, right? But the truth is, in a real couple, you'd expect a relationship of 10, 20 years to show fruit that there'd be a much deeper, more meaningful relationship than somebody, a couple that's known each other for three months or something, or for six months. Now, you go to a wedding and you see after six months, I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's one of those things that makes me very nauseous. You know, you ever see young couples and they talk to each other and there's a like, they're all like, oh, my pussy, pussy, pussy. Like, you know, they, they get like all funny about each other. And you're like, oh, no, just not here, not here. You're making everybody else, oh, I'm making me nauseous. I'm, I'm going to go to the bathroom. You know, I'm going to puke, right? It's, it's horrible. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, you see this. Now, is that real? That's not real. Anybody who's got a real relationship been married for 10, 20, 30 years looks at that and goes, yeah, we also used to be cute. Then we grew up and then we grew, then we created a real relationship. That's not a relationship just talking like babies to each other. Yeah, that's not real. That's baby talk. Okay, so it's cute. So you're new and you're infatuated with each other. And so it's baby talk. And if you speak to somebody, you speak to a couple that's newly, I remember speaking to a, new, uh, a newlywed couple. And I said to them, you know, I said, your father, I said to the, I said to the husband, I said, you know, your father called me up before you guys got married. He called me up for information. I'm glad like the information was good. And then, you know, whatever I said didn't go over badly or whatever. Like you didn't see any, you know, they didn't see anything negative in what I said about your wife. He looks at me and goes, there's nothing negative to say about my wife. And I'm like, welcome to newlyweds. Welcome to newlywed central, right? Yes. Because you know what? Infatuation blinds you to all problems and mistakes. 
And love takes those things and magnifies them. And so I love my wife, but I know all of her shortcomings. And that's part of us being married. And it's the other way around also. It's not only that I know her, she knows, pardon? Oh, well done, Michael. Two points for you when you go home. <laughs> and that Michael's going to puke, right? Fantastic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you know what? But we all, you know, the, the longer you're married, the more you know. I know that I have my problems and my wife knows that I have my issues. But now she knows, she knows I'm not perfect. Of course, I'm not perfect. But she knows that, you know, I'm married to this individual. These are his shortcomings. And, you know, this is what, this is what we deal with together. But that's who I marry. Whereas when you get married, when you're three, six months into a relationship and you think he's Mr. Perfect and she's Mrs. Perfect, he can never do anything wrong and she can never put a foot wrong. Like, come on, that's not real. We know that's not real. Baruch Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu creates it in such a way that when you have a relationship, early on in the relationship, there's this idyllic feeling and then it goes away and then you need to regain that idyllic feeling through work. That's what Kodesh Baruch Hu does with all things. Whenever there's something, you know, especially in a relationship, Kodesh Baruch Hu gives you a glimpse of what it could be. And then he says, okay, now you can see what a relationship could feel like. Now I want you to start again and start it on your own. Okay. Now that you know what is actually possible, now you need to work and create it yourself. Because I'm not giving you this for free. Relationships don't come free. They come with a lot of work. Every serious relationship that we have, whether it is a friendship, whether it is children, whether it is parents, whether it is spouses, I don't care what relationship it is. Every relationship that you have, if you want the relationship to be a serious relationship, it will only be that with a serious amount of investment. You cannot have a serious relationship with somebody else without having serious investment with it. Correct? And that's love, ahava. The word ahava, love, the root of it, says Rav Eliopian, is have, to give. Because he says there's two types of love. He likes to call it, with we're calling it infatuation, is what Rav Eliopian calls, he calls it gefiltefish love. You know why he calls it gefiltefish love? If I said to you, okay, I don't know, I'll choose somebody over here. Right. Michael, do you like fish? Yeah, like what kind of fish do you like? Yeah, do you like salmon? Yeah, so Michael likes salmon, right? Michael just told us he likes salmon. So because he likes salmon so much, he takes it out of the water and let, stops it from breathing, bangs it over the head, cuts the head off, fillets it and sticks it in the oven with a whole bunch of sauces. That's how you like fish. If you like the fish, you'd keep the poor fish in the water. Yeah? Now, it's, it's true for all of us, right? If you ask me if I like steak, it's the same thing, right? So what's the answer really? When I say I like fish, what am I really saying? I like the feeling that I get, like you said, when I eat fish. So whose love is that? That's self-love. That's got nothing to do with the fish. I love myself and fish makes me feel good. And so I love fish. I don't, I personally don't. You know, I, don't, don't I don't want anybody to, <laughs> I mean, you know me for long enough. No one should accuse me of saying that I love fish. I'm talking for Michael. Pardon? Oh, sure. Oh, goodness. Yes. Okay. But, but when we say I love something, you have to differentiate between do I actually love that individual or that thing, or do I love myself and the feeling that I get from that? Infatuation is exactly that. I love the feeling that I get from spending time with this individual. I love the way this person makes me feel. I love the way this person talks to me. Everything's about me, right? And that's why I'm on cloud nine. And that's why I hear the bells and the angels and the harps or whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? All this stupidity. But that's all about me. It's not real. Real is when I really know the other person well, and I love the other person for the investment that I have made in them and they've made in me. That's true love. And that only comes with a lot of hard work. You cannot just get it for free. It doesn't exist in this world for free. And anybody who believes who they can get it for free will be very, very quickly disillusioned. And therefore, Yehuda says, I now have to give up a tremendous amount for my brother, Binyamin. That investment that Yehuda makes in Binyamin pays off in a dividend that 
creates a relationship unlike any other. Let me ask you a question. Especially parents, there's nobody here who's a parent of a little child, right? But when you have a little one-year-old child, what's the most lovely thing in the world? My little one-year-old child. What's the most annoying thing in the world? My one-year-old child. Yeah? Don't you find that weird? Isn't that strange? The most, the thing that wakes me up in the middle of the night, the thing where I have to constantly go and clean their nappies and, and they walk around the house and they destroy. One-year-olds and two-year-olds are little destructive little things. They go around the house and anything they can find that they can put in their mouth or that they can break or they can throw down or that they can make a mess of, they will do it. She so said, if you come to the room and the house looks a mess, like, ah, what did you do? I love you so much. You know what happens? You see that again and again. And you're like, sometimes you walk in. The, the cutest thing is sometimes like, you know, it's a, the difference between parents and grandparents. The grandparents walk into the room and this little grandchild is absolutely made, created havoc in this room. And you're like, oh, what happened? And your daughter's like, isn't she cute? And you're like, no, she's not. Look what she did. She, she took my entire set of dishes and threw it out. Isn't that clever? Like, it's not clever, okay? It's not clever. It's not funny. It's expensive and it's stupid. Don't do that. But as a parent, you're like, at the same time, it's the most annoying thing in the world and the most beloved thing in the world also. Why do the two go together? The answer is because as parents, we need to invest in our children again and again and again and again. And that grows the love because now I have invested so much in that child. And by the way, it's part of the reason also that children never have the same feelings for parents that parents have for children, okay? Who feels, who will put themselves out more? Will a parent put themselves out more for a child or a child put themselves out more for a parent? Usually, in most instances, the parents put themselves out more for the children. And many, many times we have it where we're disappointed with our kids. Like, you know, I've done so much for you. Now that's what you, that's what you do. That's what you give me back. Yeah, you ever had that? You think to yourself, like, you know, I'd expect more from you. But sometimes you have to realize you as a parent have invested so much into your children over so many years that there is that tremendous bond where you've given and given and given and therefore you feel that connection. Your child hasn't given back to you in the same way. Your child, for many, many years, has just taken. Kids take, and they take quite a bit. And you give you give as a parent you're giving you're giving money and you're giving time and you're giving energy and you're giving emotion again and again and again and again and the children take it and take it and take it and take it almost without an end yeah well and as parents we do we give till it hurts we do right but children don't give in the same way which is why children oftentimes will not feel the same way about their parents as parents feel about their kids not with the same level of intensity, right? That's not to say children don't love their parents because children love their parents. But if you were to ask somebody, who's got a more intense love? The parent for the child or the child for the parent? What would you say? The parent for the child has a more intense love than the child has for the parent. Because the parent has invested all sorts of things into this child for years, for decades. And it means you feel a connection over there. Yehuda feels that connection now to Binyamin. Binyamin feels a connection to Yehuda. Through that intense act of giving over here, where Yehuda says, I am willing to put myself on the line. And putting himself on the line, that form of giving creates a connection that can almost not be compared to any other connection. You just can't find anything else that has a connection like that. Why? Because that's how it goes. When you give, you create a connection. It doesn't come on its own. Yehuda creates that connection through the giving. Okay? So that's the first idea I wanted to share with you. I thought it was a very beautiful idea. Moving on to another idea over here. Okay. So let's see. There are a few ideas. This is a very, <clears throat> this is, I would say, you know, certain ideas. It's interesting. I find when you look at certain Rabonim, you, can almost tell which kind of Rav says which kind of things. Meaning to say that different people have their own slant in how they see things, right? So if you are a person who's very involved in, I don't know, business, 
So in the Torah, you'll constantly see things about business. If you are a person who's involved in medicine, so you're constantly looking for the medical slant within the Torah. Okay? And within different Rabbonim, if you are Hasidish, you'll see a much more Hasidic slant in the Torah. If you are German descent, Yekish, you have a much more Yekish way of looking at the Torah. There are different ways of looking at the Torah. So for example, things that you see in Rav Sham Shofal Hirsch, you never see those same similar things in other Mepharshim because Rav Hirsch was very German. He was very, very Yekish. He was Rabbi Dr. Hirsch and highly educated. And so his whole Welt on showing when he looks at the Torah is seen through the prism of all of his experiences. So the way I see things it can be different to the way somebody else sees you know, things. I often have it, I, you know, I used to have this thing where I used to ask people, you know, which svarim do you use? Or do you have any droshes that you've prepared beforehand that maybe we could share around? And I, once or twice I read other people's stuff. And I thought to myself, you know what? It doesn't speak to me. Not because they give, are they doing all right? Oh, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Leave the spider there. It's fine. He's come to hear this year. It's so nice the spider came to hear this year as well. Just leave it. Clive, you're safe. Ian, don't worry. Yeah? Okay? Um, pardon? It's okay. Don't worry about it. It's not going anywhere. Right? Anyway, so where was I up to? Yeah, people have different people. Different Rabbonim have different ways of seeing things. You see things through your kaleidoscope and through your belt and challenge. And therefore, oftentimes when I see other people tell me, oh, I'm going to say X, Y, and Z, and I listen to it, and I'm saying to myself, like, okay, it's interesting, but it just it doesn't speak to me. And I've had other people who have told them my divitar and they're like, yeah, very nice. And I can tell that they it doesn't speak to them either because that's not really where their shorish and nefesh is. That's not really where, how things speak to them. So Rav Schwab, who is, again, of German descent, says the following. They come back to Yosef, they come back from Yosef and they speak to their father, Yaakov Avinu, and they tell them the following. So let's have the following. Verse, we're on page 256. We're in verse 25. Mem hey, chof hey. 45, 25. Vayalim Mitzrayim, they came up from Egypt. Vayavo Eretz Canaan, they came to the land of Canaan. And Yaakov him to Yaakov the father. Vayagidu l'alema, they say to him, Oh, Yosef, chai, Yosef is still alive. Vechihum ha'shev ha'chalat Yisrael, and he is alive, and he is not only alive, he is the ruler of the entire land of Egypt. Vayof ha'glibo, his heart skipped a beat. He rejected it. He didn't believe them, which is weird, right? You'd expect him to say, I got great news for you. What? Yosef's are still alive. No, him and I didn't believe them. Oh, Yaakov. Yeah, so that depends. But he says, but the Torah seems to say, like he felt like, you know, oh, that can't be. He just felt incredulous. How could that be? And then what happens is the following. By Dabroil, they spoke to him, Ace called Divre Yosef Ashadiban, and they taught him all of the words that Yosef she spoke to them. Vayaris Hagolis, and he sees the chariots, Ashashalach Yosef lost his also that Yosef sent to pick him up, but Techi Ruach Yaakov Avim. And then Yaakov Avinu's spirit is raised, and suddenly Yaakov Avinu feels, okay, I believe it. So what happens? They come, they tell him, he won't believe it, and then they tell him again, and suddenly he does believe it. They show him the chariots and he believes it. So what, what, what happened in the middle of the year? So Rav Schwab's is a very interesting thing. There's actually a big discussion about this, whether the brothers ever owned up to this or not. Rav Schwab is of the opinion, yes, obviously they did own up to this story that they sold Yosef. Because what happens is as follows. The greatest punishment that a liar has is that he starts to believe his own propaganda. That's the greatest punishment. You know, somebody tries to make a big deal of themselves. I am this, I am that. You know, they make a whole fuss of themselves. And guess what? They're really, they're not telling the truth. But after a while, you know what ends up happening? They start to believe their own story. That's the worst thing when you start to believe your own lies. When you yourself cannot tell the difference between what is reality and what's a chalem, what's a dream in your head, then you're in trouble. So what happens over here is, for 22 years, they are lying to the father. They brought the father, as we read two weeks ago, they took a goat, and they shechted the goat, and they dipped the katonis, they dipped this tunic in blood. 
the Technicolor Dreamcoat, and they hand it to the father and say, tell us, do you know who this is? Oh my gosh, this belongs to Yosef. Tarof, Tarof, Yosef. Yosef's been eaten by a wild animal. That is what they allowed him to believe. And they knew it was a lie, and they went along with it for 22 years. And now comes the moment of truth. Now you have to say, well, actually, that's not really what happened. If you ever had to, if you've ever had to own up at home to something that didn't really happen the way you told the story for many years, it's very awkward. It's a very awkward thing. And at that point, it's hard to say, well, if I've fed you a lie for 20 years, if I've made belief for 20 years, I came from Vienna, and I finally tell you, actually, it's never true. I've never been to Vienna in my life. You're going to be like, that's weird. I mean, you've been telling the story for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. When I say just joking, I won't point another one. I say just joking. You'll find it hard to take this joke. You say, oh, you, come on. It can't be that just joking. That doesn't make any sense. What do you mean you're just joking? For 20 years, you've been telling a story and the story's all fabricated. It's all rubbish. Doesn't make sense. You sometimes have a hard time disillusioning people from the lies because they bought into the lies so much it's hard to take them out of that lie. So they've told them this lie, they've told them this lie, and now they say, he's alive. He's like, alive? He got eaten up by an animal. How can he be alive? That's ridiculous. Yeah? Like, no, no, but he, he's alive. We, we just smoked him in Egypt. Are you hallucinating? Is there something wrong with you? What are you guys smoking? What's the matter with you? Right? He's dead. He got killed by an animal, right? Remember? Tunic full of blood. Dead. Uh-oh. Right? Because now we can't convince him of the truth. So you know what happens, says Rav Schwab. The next verse tells you. So we say the first time around, he told him, they told him Yosef's still alive and he's the ruler in Mitzrayim. By Yofag Liba's heart skips a beat. He, he rejects it. He didn't believe them. But you know what happens now? By Dabru Elov, they spoke to him. They tell him everything Yosef said to them. What's everything Yosef said to them? What did Yosef say to them? And then he saw the chariots and then Yaakov became aware of what happened. You know what Yosef said to them? Let's go back to how Yosef introduces himself to his brothers. Verse 4 in chapter 45. So page 252. Verse 4. Yosef starts off saying, look at verse 3. We start with the first one. Yosef says to his brother, I am Yosef. My father is still alive. His brothers could not answer him because they were absolutely shocked. They were themselves in shock. They couldn't believe this was happening. Now listen to the next sentence. Because come closer. I have something to tell you. Listen to this. And he says, Ani Yosef Achichem, I am Yosef, your brother. Do you remember you sold me to Egypt? Do you remember that story? Nobody else knew the story. That was a quiet story. We didn't take pictures and put it on Instagram or Facebook. This was private. Nobody knew about this. Ha! There you go. That's a bit of information that you weren't expecting, is it? Like, um, I guess. So what's Ace called Diva Yosef Shadiba Alem? What's all the words that Yosef said to them? They now have to say to Yaakov, I have to own up. I'm Yosef who was sold to Egypt. No, that whole story never happened. Do you remember the story with the tunic? Yeah, that was our fault. Do you remember that we made believe it was eaten up by an animal? That was our fault. We had to really own up to the truth. And once they owned up to the truth, Yaakov suddenly realized, oh, now I get it. But it took owning up to the truth to actually being able to convince Yaakov Avinu that his own son was still alive. Because until he owned up, it wasn't going to work. Because that is the punishment of somebody who tells a lie again and again and again. At one point or another, you become like the boy who cried wolf. And then when you finally say, hey, wolf, wolf, nobody comes because you cried wolf too often. And now nobody believes you because you've lied too often that now at this point, nobody's willing to take the truth from you. And Yaakovino is not willing to take the truth from them. And therefore, says Rav Schwab, the only way was for them to come clean. And when they came clean, suddenly they believed. 
And I've seen that before. You know, sometimes you're talking to people and you're trying to get the truth out of them. And they tell you a bit of a fib over here, a little foible over there. It just doesn't make sense. And you finally sit down with them and say, tell me the truth. What happened? And they suddenly give you the full account of the story. And you're like, "Uh uh-huh. That makes sense. Yeah, do you understand what I'm saying? Suddenly it sits with you. Until now, it didn't sit well with you. And when they tell you half a truth and half a truth, they had to come clean. And only when they came clean were they able for, to convince Yaakov Avinu. And that's the important thing. It's coming clean is very, very important. You have to be careful when you tell a lie. You're not supposed to lie, but even if you did tell a lie, be careful that you don't convince yourself of your own lie. And that you don't create a situation where even when now when you want to undo it and you want to tell the truth, nobody's going to take your word for it anymore. Nobody wants to believe you because everybody's convinced of your lie because you lied so well that nobody now takes anything else off you. That's important. And that's what happens over here with Yaakov Inu. And only when they own up, only when they say, hey, listen, my bad. It was my mistake. I did something wrong. Oh, okay. That makes sense now. Now I can believe it. Now I can hear it. Now I take it off you. So that's the ideas I want to share with you. There were more ideas, but we've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Even though it's bank holiday, thank you for those who joined us on Zoom, on Facebook Live, on Twitter anytime. David Eisenberg at gmail.com. If you want to get in touch, please come again next week. Looking forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you. Well, they're